The brothers wish. The brothers wish, brothers wish. The brothers wish. The brothers. You're now listening to Greg. It's the Brothers Wisp. Let's take a Hey, everybody. Ride this is Greg brothers. with another Greg Talks. This is number 11. This cast, I have one Justin Burdine with me. Hello, hello. Oh, wow. You actually sound pretty good. I think you've got good. your microphone situated very well. Well, thank you. Thank you. We did, did, did you know, take 30 minutes of setup. For... <laughs> <laughs> all right. For all those that are unaccustomed to this one, this is a companion to our normal Brothers Wisp. Uh, podcast where that one is extremely technically focused. This one, as of late, has been not very technical, uh, but it is an informal mix of technical and non-technical material. So uh, just keep that in mind. Stay open-minded. I'm uh, I'm very curious about people, and that tends to come out a lot in this. So uh, let's see. Uh, well, how's life, Justin? Tell me a little bit about yourself. Ah, uh, a little bit about myself. Um, yeah. Um... I'm, I guess you've had James on before. So I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm James's older brother for those who've listened. Uh, to older, more, better more looking, obviously better haircut, better haircut. Definitely. For better sure. Haircut. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, he definitely got the jeans on the hair. Uh, yeah. What I'm, uh, live out here in college station, uh, live on 20 acres, I do a lot of, uh, yard work and maintenance and I love tinkering with stuff. I work <laughs> at a really cool company where I get to do some cool stuff. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you're an IT guy. You've been in IT yes. uh, for most of your life, right? So yeah. I, I I can only remember bits and pieces. So I know at one point you lived like out in California, right? I've lived, yeah, I've lived a bunch of different, pretty much every place you can think of I've lived. Uh, so yeah, but I, I did start my career out in California. I originally wanted to go out and work in, in uh, movies. Uh, so I did basically when I was growing up, I had computers when I was you know, third grade and from then on. Uh, and so I was always interested in computers and then, uh, but, but movies always fascinated me. So like, that's where I started my career and, and then kind of pivoted into, uh, that was when I was out there working in films, that's when I it's kind of the whole industry pivoted to using computers. Um, and so really kind of going from practical effects to, uh, to computer effects. And so once I saw that, I'm like, oh, this is amazing. So I just, so you were a kid, you knew you wanted to do yeah. something with movies. How was yeah. the, I mean, what was the was a natural progression for you so it's like hey i want to do something in movies it was there a specific thing you wanted to do in movies or oh yeah i mean i i knew i wanted to do visual effects from very early on i think i started thinking oh i want to be an actor just because uh, my grandfather's head was an actor um and that was kind of hit, enamored uh, me but um then once i realized my friends and i would would sit every weekend we'd sit and record um videos just do really weird stuff dumb stuff and we weren't very good at storytelling so we were but we were really good at like Hey, remember that thing when this thing happened and we, we would kind of dissect how things were done in movies and that you just kind of that deconstruction and then reconstruction and just problem solving really lended itself or really kind of sparked in my head. And so I knew pretty early on. I mean, I, I every book that was out there, all the behind the scenes on how movies work, uh, all of those um, I just devoured as a kid. And so that's it, it progressed pretty quickly. By about seventh grade, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So kind of zeroed in and, and fired off at that. That's awesome. So seventh grade, I... Um... Was I think I was like a freshman and I knew I want to do stuff with computers and I kind of it kind of gave me a trajectory to, to move towards. Yeah. Um, I felt very fortunate because like when I went to college, yeah. I didn't actually go to a real college. I went to a, a second high school. I went to a technical school, right? A technical college. Um, uh, right. My thinking was I know exactly what I want to do. I don't need to take a bowling yeah. class and you know, like all this Ouch, other man <laughs> and you hit the nail on the head for me. I took the bowling class <laughs> and, and I, honestly, looking back, I, I did not need the four years. I, I, in fact, I think it was probably 10 years into my career before anybody even asked me about, about high school or uh, college transcripts. So I, you know, I do, I think, I think learning is always a good thing. I think oh, yeah, people sure. learn differently. Um, but I look now at my kids who, who actually kind of want to do the same thing. I, um, uh, uh, I did. And, uh, I actually had looked at a, a college um, down in Florida that was very much what you're talking about, very hands-on, very kind of almost vo vocational. Um, and, uh, you know, back in the day when I was a kid, I remember that being kind of, oh, you know, you don't want to do that. And I think now it's like, oh, that, that's exactly what you need, quite frankly. Um, I think also it, it's always good to, you know, round yourself, you know, well, make yourself well-rounded. And I think that's the idea behind a liberal arts college. But um, I'll, I'll be honest, I think, you know, for me, it, I I'm, was very, you know, if you look at my grades, it was like everything I wanted to do, 
straight A's. Everything else, <laughs> uh, and my bowling class got an A in that too. But, <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah. It's, and it's not to, and that was that was just my brain at the time, right? It's like I I just want to get in and get out and do you know the exact thing that I wanted to do, and so yeah. uh, I guess I I got in there and, and got out. And sometimes I look back and wonder, did I really um, did I miss out on the college experience? Right, because mm. it was it was very different for me. But then I came to the realization that I was such a, a shut in. Uh, it's so socially awkward that had I been at a college, it would have basically been the exact same experience for me. I would have just <laughs> stayed in my tiny little bubble as much as possible and right, and right, just gotcha. existed. So I don't, I don't think the college experience was something that I necessarily uh, missed out on. So you went to school for uh, visual effects? That kind of well, stuff? yeah. Yeah, believe it or not, I ended up... Uh, my, my parents were very, uh, very good at, at supporting kind of making sure I went to college but and and in that they kind of really kind of narrowed the field for me and I think they really wanted me to have kind of a um, you know I, they gave me choice but it was kind of a uh, you need to go down this track so I ended up going to a um, a Christian liberal arts college in the middle of nowhere uh, so if anybody's been to you know knows about Taylor University uh, it's in the middle of a cornfield in Indiana it's a good school it's really cool um, uh, it's I certainly think it's uh, it's it was good at the time for me because they were uh, really focused on, they had a really good communication school, a good television and film school, uh, more television at the time, uh, but it's really grown up to be a lot more. Uh, but we were kind of the first class that really kind of went through there that had this kind of really cool experience. So um, I, I, I love it. I, I wouldn't probably you know, send my kids there these days, but um, you know, it is what it is. Well, I guess those kind of programs were still in their infancy, right? So yeah. Yeah, the, very much the, so. The people that were teaching those classes, did they actually have like industry experience? Like they had been out there doing Yeah, it's or? funny you should say that. Yeah. You, the guy, I mean, quite frankly, the one of the big factors that got me in there was, you know, they had their own TV station. Um, and the guy who was leading it had been uh, a guy who, uh, a guy named Barry Pavisi, a uh, great guy who worked in ABC, uh, up literally in, in uh, All My Children, and was a, a technical director for, you know, uh, the, oh, now I'm going to biff it, uh, whatever the ABC you know, not news show was back in the day, um, but had been doing that for you know, 15 some odd years. Uh, so great experience. You know, he, he was one of those guys who was very hands on. So he kind of took my myself and my roommate under his wing and we just, you know, basically flourished. So it was a really cool, amazing experience, quite frankly. That's cool. So I, I've noticed that like some people that go to like a real, uh, a real college, I'm going to do that in quotes, do it air quotes. <laughs> uh, people that go to a real college, there's um, kind of like, um, a network set up for him, you know, like here at a and I call it the good old boy network where it actually yep. just having that class ring or, or whatever the counterpart is at, at other colleges um, actually opens a lot of doors. Right. And so it, yeah. you can, um, you can get a lot of introductions to that way. Is that something that kind of, I'm just curious. It's like, so, okay, I've gone to college. I've done this thing. How do I actually make it to Hollywood and, and start working? Yeah. On this stuff? It's like, how do you, how, yes. do, how do you bridge that gap? <laughs> Well, quite frankly, I was I was lucky in a couple of things. Um, a, I was very driven, so I knew just from literally devouring all of that information about uh, what was out there. The internet was just kind of picking in, picking up. So uh, this was like ninety two, ninety three, um, and um, so there was information that was out there, and there were people who were kind of assembling kind of information. So I I just every chance I got, I was putting pieces together, and I still have it somewhere. I've got a notebook of like. Um, every visual effects company that existed at the time and who all their key contacts were. So basically, there wasn't, to, so to answer your question, there really wasn't anybody going, hey, here's how you get into Hollywood. Nowadays, that you, you know, A&M's got a great um, uh, program for kind of getting people, they've got you know, people from the industry who come in and a lot of the colleges that have, um, my understanding, I should say, that have those um, visual visual schools um, like Viz Lab and, and uh, or, or that are oriented that way have kind of a, a pairing with the industry. So they have people come out and do uh, interviews, interviews, if you will, if we're going to use air quotes. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so yeah, so there's that they, these days. I, I kind of just, you know, put the boot, pulled up the bootstraps or however you want to say it. And uh, I just started making calls and saying, hey, you know, do you guys do internships? Do you want to, you know, do what, what are the opportunities? Um, and I was lucky because I had family out on the West Coast, so I could make that jump. Um, I look now where I don't have family out there, and I've got a, a um, you know, uh, some kids who want to be in that industry. It's now, now I'm kind of like, well, shoot, how do I make this happen? Because it was, it was a fairly easy thing for me to go out and stay with my uh, my grandmother and and kind of get my 
kind of establish a base without all that risk. Um, and so uh, anyway, so that's what I was able to do back in the day. Uh, and I was very fortunate. Um, I had a great uh, mentor that I happened to find at uh, during my internship. And I, I swear by it. I, you know, quite frankly, I, I think if you can do an internship, if you're trying to get in Hollywood, I think if you do an internship and just, you know, do the work, uh, it's amazing. How, you know, the people who kind of really admire the, uh, somebody who can just keep their head down and do work, um, you know, because, again, you're doing it for free, uh, but, you know, you don't complain. You just whatever they're asking you to do, just sit and appreciate, uh, you know, what the, the moment that you're in and, and the opportunity you have, because, people, you know, that's how I got my first job was literally making those impressions on people. And I, I could go into it, but I did a lot of different different types of jobs and um, thankless jobs where you know, you're just doing the stuff. And then sure enough, I went back to school for one more semester. And um, I, within a, the first month there, I got uh, I got a call and say, hey, you know, as soon as you're done, we're ready to have you. That's awesome. So, That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, it was good stuff. So what was your I, I, I like to ask this thing uh of people who have gone on quite a journey because I know like your whole career was, there was uh, probably a roller coaster working over there yeah. in Hollywood, a lot of highs, lows, a lot of stress and pressure and stuff yeah. like that. So what were your expectations going into it? And then what was the reality of it after you actually got there and you saw yeah. behind the curtain, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know that I really had expectations. Be well, I guess I did. If I had just done so much research, I kind of knew the different jobs you do there. Um, I knew, what each of those entailed. Um, and I kind of even knew kind of how you could kind of work the system to get those different jobs. Um, I would say, you know, the, the thing that kind of, so I, I was, I, when I got there, I knew I, I was ready to just, just do it, you know, and it was great. It was, I got some onset experience. I, I got pretty much everything I got to, got to see and touch. Um, I think the thing that I wasn't ready for, which had really nothing to do with the actual job, it was just more of being out and going from, the freedom of being, you know, a high schooler and then in college, where you kind of just come and go and you got classes, but you've got this very free world uh, to, you know, working out in LA, which is pretty much the expectation that you're going to, you know, be there at 9 a.m. and you're going to work till about 8 30 at night. And, you know, that going from that jump uh, was a pretty big jump for me. So it was kind of like, oh, and now I have to do this for the rest of my life. Huh. <laughs> that, that, that was kind of the realization. So, you know, once the once I would say if you're looking for that moment of kind of like the, the, the contrast, I think, you know, you got a couple months in and when once the job became a job, that's when it was like, oh, OK, all right. This is this is definitely uh, they're definitely going to have to keep giving me a paycheck to show up. I'm not doing this pro bono. So <laughs> uh, so it, but I would still say it was probably some of the most fun years because it was it really were it was uh, uh, just everything was brand new, you know new job, new world, uh, new experiences. So, uh, and it was, it was a culmination of, you know, everything I wanted to do, uh, when I was growing up. So that's cool. Well, you got out there, yeah. you, you got the job, you started doing some stuff. How long were you actually kind of in the industry, I guess? Well, so uh, a couple of, I would say three years, um, full time. And then I, I went off and did something else, uh, right after the, the kind of the dot com thing blew up. Not, not really because of that, just because I, I again, I got to that end of that. Uh, well, I can tell the whole story, but it's, it's, um, it, it just perspectives change. I basically had realized after about three and a half years of working that I had kind of hit everything I wanted to do. And now all of a sudden I was like, well, is this what I want to keep doing out in LA or do we want to kind of go and experience something else? Um, I then kind of went back later on and worked on another couple of projects um, one, after I had moved to Michigan. Um, and that was, you know, that was definitely the real side of Hollywood, quite frankly, because I had moved up to a, and I'd gotten a level where I was kind of running a, a the, the IT side of a visual effects company, small visual effects company, but it was, it, you know, you get into the, the politics of it. You know, when I was younger, it was kind of like, oh, this is fun. I, you know, don't really have any responsibilities right. other than, you know, and then you get to, hey, you've got some pretty big, expo you know, responsibilities. And that's when it comes, you know, really kind of set in. It was like, this is, this is definitely a job, so. Hmm. But yeah, total over about span of about five years, but about three and a half uh, full time and you know, some extra. So, extra time. what's your what's your proudest moment you look on? Uh, you look back on. You know, I, I'm sure you did some project that you were like, man, that is so cool. And it got into something that was awesome. Yeah, there. yeah. No, that's. I would say if the I would say the coolest thing to look back on. And re, in fact, I just watched something last night. I don't really know how I got onto it. Um, but um, uh, one of the things that I, I was very fortunate to do is I ended up. Um, 
getting hired on to work on the first Matrix movie. Um, and I didn't know what it was at the time uh, because it was like Keanu Reeves science fiction. And you're like, at the time, you know, this is 1998, I think maybe spring of 98. Keanu Reeves was Bill and Ted. Like, so when you hear Keanu Reeves in science yeah. fiction, you're like, what the heck is this? Whatever. All right, it's a job. <laughs> so, you know, and, uh, you know, my previous jo- project had wrapped up and I was ready for something new. Uh, I didn't really want to move out of LA, but uh, it was it was a good opportunity. Uh, it was a unique opportunity. Uh, so I ended up moving up to uh, Northern California um, and, um, yeah, and got to work on that. So the cool part about that, the, the movie, uh, again, when we were making it, we really didn't know what we were making. Um, you, you read the script and it was very kind of weird. Um, it, it, and we're only seeing from the visual effects side, you're only seeing about 75 shots and they're very pieced in parts. You have no context for what oh, they yeah. are. It makes sense. They yeah, give you so, exactly what you need and you work yeah, on that. And exactly, else. exactly. So, I mean, you could piece it together, but it still didn't feel like it was going to be this big blockbuster. You're like, all right. Um, but, uh, you know, as I, as I worked on it, the, my job on that project was to run all of the ingest um, and uh, the in and out of, of the, the production company, meaning all the data that's coming in. They're shooting on film. So this is back. We're still shooting on film. So anything that's coming in has to get scanned. We then ingest it on, you know, good old DLT tapes. Uh, we bring them into the computers and then get them out to the, art, the artists. Uh, one of the jobs that needed to be done was taking all of the bullet time effects. And we had, I think, five shots. I forget. It's been 20 years. But uh, I think we had five, sh- five of the bullet time shots that we, we, uh, we shot and put together. Um, but they needed to be assembled. I can, I can go into the details if you really want, but the, the shots were shot on, on still cameras, 120 still cameras, and needed to be assembled so you could actually understand them because they're, they're each camera is shooting out of sequence. So you're getting those scanned and then you have to know how to put them together. And right. some of the cameras would misfire. Anyway, I, I, that was my job. I essentially ass- did all of the initial assembly of the bullet time shots. I certainly didn't do all the artistry, but, but you know, uh, that's what I did. So that's probably one of the cooler, cooler things. That sounds hella tedious. Uh, it was neat. Well, because I wrote scripts to do it. So it was kind of my first foray into like, oh, let's, let's, this surely has to be automated. I'm not doing this by hand. And so you'd still have to go back and, and make sure the shots looked good. Uh, but you could at least write a script that said, okay, in this folder, I can assemble these based on the information I had on how the, the rig itself worked. That's super cool, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> That's Definitely. Cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, at the time it just felt like a job, but you know, yeah. now I look back and go, dude, that was pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. Well, you were talking about crazy hours that they expect you got, and, and that was at five days a week, six days a week, or so it's five days a week uh, right. until we start wrapping up to the end of the production, and then it's Saturday, and then it becomes Sunday, and then you're then you're basically running, you know, basically twenty four hours. So I know because I've I've heard some like uh, I've listened to some medical podcasts and stuff like that, and they're talking about you know when doctors are going through their internships and stuff like that, how they just give them insane amounts of hours, and part of that is. You know, they want to expose them to everything they possibly can because it builds confidence in them and things like that. But also it weeds people out, you know, if you can't hang. And I'm assuming that's part of what's going on there, right? Yeah, not so much once you're in the job, but I I can tell you a funny story. When I was an intern, um, I I was an intern at a company called Boss Film Studios, um, which no longer exists, but it's, it essentially was a really cool place. If you look back, it's like Ghostbusters, uh, 2010. I mean, it's a really amazing, <laughs> uh, amazing, uh, visual effects were done in this building. Um, that's kind of why it was my top choice. Um, uh, anyway, long story short, I was there with about five other interns and I remember one of them literally was kind of, I, I'd hear her every day kind of complaining about the work she's, she was having to do. And I'm like, man, this is visual effects. Like, how do you not want to just like be here and be in the moment? She ended up basically kind of refusing to do work and then finally got literally fired from being an intern. And I'm like, they're not even paying you. They like, <laughs> I was just going to like, all right. You know, I, I just, I, mean, I still tell that story every so often, just kind of underscore, like, just appreciate the thing you have. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but I mean, it's, you, they kind of throw anything and everything at you uh, really. And I, I looked at it as, as opportunity and not, not like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm sweeping up the floor in the studio, but I'm like, I'm sweeping up the floor in the studio that they shot this scene from Ghostbusters in, or this scene from, you know, they were at the time they were doing, Air, you know, Air Force One. I'm like, well, there's like models that they're trusting me not to go and break and, you know, they're sitting there and I got to, you know, like I got to see that stuff. So it was, it was really cool stuff. In fact, one of the things was they, the guys were going out to lunch one day and the, the fighter jets that come in and escort Air Force One, um, they were all motion control. So these are big, big, you know, probably I think three foot, 
I wish I had a camera back in the day. What do you call this? Is like uh, bigotures or something? Oh, I don't. I have no idea. Uh-huh. Uh, I, th- I think it's what oh, like Peter Jackson's crew calls them. Like, so they're oh, not exactly miniature, but they're not really big, so they call them yeah. bigotures. Yeah, kind of the, in the I, middle can, I can see. Yeah, I can <laughs> see him coming up with a, with a, a name like that. At the time, they were just they were just models. But uh, anyway, so they were on these big motion controls, and they were like, "Hey, we need to go out to lunch. Can you just sit here and guard these?" Because they didn't want anybody. You know, messing with them because you, if you get if, if they're in the middle of shooting and they're they're out of sequence, uh, you could mess the whole thing up. You blow oh, right. a day or two. So anyway, that, I just sat there for an hour while they went out and got lunch. It's cool. <laughs> so I got to look at those models and or the bigotures. Uh, it, was, it was a good experience. That's so cool, man. But you know what? And that and that's what I try and like. I have to tell my kids regularly. You know, it's like uh, every everything you're exposed to, every opportunity you have to do something, everything you ever do in your life, whether it's crappy or fun somehow you know it feeds into you and somehow you're going to be able to use it later right they're always trying to say i'm never going to use this stuff at school that is like their their mantra they always love saying that i'm like at some point this will pay off Uh, you know you may not even realize it now but at some point all that stuff comes back to us right and so the idea of um the internship you're doing crap jobs and some of this stuff but, but i bet there's some things that you still utilize every day that that you acquired back then that you may not even be aware of right oh yeah absolutely yeah i mean it, it goes to character it goes to uh you know your your ability to endure you know hey you're gonna sit around for an hour and do nothing okay but you know <laughs> I, I still i still have that experience to go back to we get to share it here right i get to tell you this cool story right yeah. i babysat some models and it was weird <laughs> but it was kind of like that's cool well too i mean so, like in your in your life now you've been I mean, I don't know if you'd call yourself a sales guy, but you're in sales and you are part yeah. of the sales machine, right? And uh, a lot of what you have to do is vamping, right? You just got to tell stories. So yeah. Uh, yeah. the more ammunition you got, the better uh, soldier you're going to be at that stuff, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's also helped that I, I've also lived in so many different places because almost every conversation I, you know, somebody will say, oh, I'm from here. And I'll say, oh, yeah, I was there too or whatever. It's, it, those kind of things help help quite a well, as well. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Storytelling is 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 the key to selling, right? You know, being able to relate, being able to have those connection points, and just having tons and tons of experience uh, doing things really helps yeah. you to connect to other people. And I think varied so, experience is incredibly yeah. important too, right? Not just because yeah. uh, there's some people who stay in one place, they live their entire life there, and so you know their view of the world, their view of life is just so limited. Um, yeah, yeah. Wherein if you you actually get out and you try and taste different stuff you know you you don't just hit the same steak restaurant and eat the same thing at the same steak restaurant right every time. exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> gotta gotta get outside that comfort zone a little bit every now and then right right, right. And something i always say is if you're comfortable you're not growing right so you've got to oh absolutely to some amount of discomfort and uh yeah i've been trying to make myself as uncomfortable here in the, <laughs> in the last stages of my life uh <laughs> as i circle the drain uh, before uh, I go down, uh, I'm trying to get as you're still a young guy, Greg. You're not going. You're, you're not. You're not going down that quick. <laughs> uh, that remains to be seen. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, right. Yeah, I've got a pool on me. That's fun, man. So, so you went out to Hollywood. You did all that crazy stuff. Yeah. Uh, at what point did you exit, and where did you go? Yeah. So um, we got done with the Matrix, um, and we uh, at, at the same time, around the same time, we were shooting uh, another movie called uh, What Dreams May Come, which was a Robin Williams movie. Uh, it's definitely an interesting movie. Very two two completely separate movies, or different movies, I should say. Um, uh, what Dreams May Come was very artistic, very dark. Uh, I guess Matrix was dark too, but uh, but that was such sci-fi. But both of them won. Uh, what Dreams May Come won uh, best visual effects, uh, an Oscar best for best vis- man for best visual effects in '98, uh, and then Matrix um, won it in '99. So. I kind of felt like, okay, I wanted to go out and do visual effects. Uh, it was amazing. I got, again, a ton of ex- different, interesting experiences. Uh, but then um, you kind of get into this, is this what I want to do? And we started thinking, well, do, you know, we want to have kids. Uh, we don't really, we didn't have a really good um, base. Uh, we were up in Northern California, so we were kind of away from, from my family. I, my dad's got a, a sister out there, but... Um, uh, but really didn't feel like we were, we were home. And so we just started trying to figure out, well, where is home? Uh, and what would that look like? So once we got done with the Matrix, uh, it started wrapping up. Uh, they were starting to do some previs for the sec- second two movies. Uh, but I started thinking, I don't know that I want to keep doing this. I want to, you know, there's so many things to do in life. Um, I don't know that I want to sit and be an IT guy for a visual effects company, especially having kind of reached the end of, not the end, but I don't know how you top two back-to-back visual effects. I guess, you know, getting my own personal ones. But 
I, th- I felt like being on the team uh, was was good enough. Um, and so basically decided, okay, I think we're going to go find something else out there. And, and that's when I really kind of thought, okay, what, where else could we go? And I had a friend who um, had gone to move to Michigan. This is actually my roommate. who I, So we both had, you know, the, these aspirations for doing, uh, he went and did television. I did film. And uh, so he ended up going and being this technical uh, vis- uh, video guy for a church. And I'm like, well, that's weird. Like, and I, this was way before mega churches were out there. Um, there was, there was um, Willow Creek in, um, in Chicago, but there weren't a lot of these. And so when I heard that they're doing three camera pr- shoots, you know, they're doing weekly productions and pr- fairly high end, you know, kind of music video esque live performances. I was like, I need to go see what this is. So I, we basically just packed up and we're like, okay, you know, let's, let's go, let's go be a part of this. So I didn't have a job. I was just doing freelance, I think web development at the time. Um, and we just packed up and let's, let's go move to Michigan. Nice. So we went out and did there, did that. And, uh, that was, that began kind of a, an interesting period in my life. Um, that where, you know, I was, I kind of felt like you said, un, uncomfortable. It was kind of like, okay, well how this doesn't feel, yeah, I didn't really have, uh, uh, know what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and so uh, we did that. It was great. But about a year into that, um, that's when I was like, uh, I got the call basically that they were going to do a sequel to one of the movies I worked on. And I was like, I'm going to go see if they need help. And so I could, that's when I went and did my, my boomerang back to Hollywood. Uh, did that for about a year. Uh, and I, we don't need to go into the details of that, but it was, <laughs> it was, it was a, a brutal experience of living in Michigan, but flying out constantly to, to California to run this visual effects company in, in Santa Monica. And it was, oof, it was, uh, probably, probably the roughest, uh, thing I've done in my career. So uh, at some point in there, you transition to saying we, instead of I. So, oh yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. We were, we all the time. I, I yeah. I, at I didn't at know what how point to... did the, we, uh, start. <laughs> so in, the, in we, this whole story, I'm just curious. Yeah, no, that's a good question. And I, I, uh, we started actually bef- uh, at, six months after I moved out to, um, Los Angeles, I moved out there in, in the, January of 97. Um, and then I, in college, I'd met my, uh, fiance, my wife, Krista. Um, and we met, um, at college, my, our last year. Um, and so I, I went off to do the Hollywood thing and, you know, we, I, right before I left, we got engaged, um, up in New York city. And, uh, and so we were kind of, we, we were a we the entire time. Uh, but we actually officially got married once, uh, about six months after being on all right, so you were out there for six months. Then did she actually come with you at that point, or did she? When, no, like she, when did she actually no, no, make no. it out to L.A.? Uh, I'm thinking she visited several times, uh, and then in August we got married. So, uh, so about eight months after being out in Hollywood, she then came out and moved out. What was the transition like uh, for Krista heading out there? Oh, that's that's probably her story to tell. But it was <laughs> it was interesting. You know, she grew up in in Ohio uh, in this tiny town of Ohio. Um, very, I, I, she, I think she would say she's fairly sheltered. Uh, and you know, I, I had, I grew up with family out in Los Angeles. We went out there probably every summer, uh, almost every summer. So I knew kind of what it was like. It felt like home to me. I even, you know, we were staying with my grandmother at the time. Hmm. So, you know, I, this was my experience of California. Um, anyway, so long story short, it was, I think it was a shocking experience, <laughs> you know, going from a tiny town in Ohio and then going to college in a tiny, you know, cornfield, uh, in, you know, and then LA and then when you're in LA yeah. she gets there and you guys are married and you're working you know yeah. 11 hour days so, yeah. yeah yeah so <laughs> yeah it was definitely an experience she got to you know kind of un- figure out what what California's like she you know had some I think she had, she had a cousin out there uh has a cousin out there um and uh so they kind of they kind of bonded and that was kind of nice but that's yeah, interesting she, definitely yeah we should that's definitely a conversation for her because she could dive into the details of that. So one. you did VFX, Mega Church, VFX again for a hot minute, and then you're yep. like, "Yeah, I'm done with this." And then you yeah, then I got yeah, then I went back. You know, I, yeah, it basically uh, that was uh, it was so many hours and so much travel, and we were just on the verge of cell phones. So just connectivity. I could do it now in a heartbeat, right? But that's, that's you know, easy peasy. But back in the day, it was, you know, like you're just nothing connected very well. You know, I think I had a note, one of those Nokia phones that were super popular that had like three lines of text on it. Um, you know, that, that's, that's the, the age of, of, of uh, phone, cell phone connectivity. We were right, in. right, right. Uh, anyway. So yeah. So basically got done with that. And we, um, uh, I just started again, looking for another job. I worked for an, an auto, 
credit company for a bit, doing their IT stuff. Uh, ultimately found a great gig at uh, a university, Oakland University, up in um, in Michigan. And so, because we were still based out of Michigan at the time, and did that. And it was great. Loved, loved that gig. Uh, but eventually, we the somebody in our church, one of the pastors that we were really close to, uh, kind of felt called. He's going to start up a church in Utah. And so, it was kind of like, oh, okay. That's interesting. And we just kept thinking about it. And it, for some reason, it was like, oh, you know what? We could do this. You, you know, and change it, your pace. I don't know. I mean, I certainly knew, I certainly, we were still in that whole f- feeling of, um, hey, we got to find what, what does home really feel like? Huh. Um, and th- we, this was definitely like, okay, Michigan is definitely not home. I love the people there, but man, the, you know, living in a frozen tundra, you know, for about yeah. seven or eight months of the year is not my cup of tea. Yeah, me um, So, uh, and Utah, I mean, we went from, I think I remember this, this quote, uh, this, this fact that, it was like Michigan is 180 days of gray. And if you look at it, the statistics in the almanac, Utah's 180 days of, of sun. So I was like, yeah, I'll take that trade. <laughs> I'll take that trade in a heartbeat. So uh, anyway, so yeah, we, we ended up moving out to Utah with about 30 other people. Um, 30 other people? No, maybe 30 other families. It was, it was a pretty large group of people. And we basically went out and started this church. Kind of the same kind of thing. Um, you know, same t- format of church. Um, the idea was going to go set up in downtown um, Salt Lake City, which wears, you know, fairly, you know, uh, obviously Utah is known for being Mormon, Mormon but yeah. down, downtown in Salt Lake City is actually pretty uh, not Mormon intentionally. Um, and so uh, we just found it really, you know, that people really connected there. So That's interesting. Yeah. So were you doing IT for the church or did you just like I was find doing, your job when you got there? Uh, so, yeah, I wasn't paid by the church. Um, I ended up getting a job at a software company that did um, uh, voice recognition. So that was pretty cool. Um, although it, it wasn't very cool that they weren't making payroll. And I found that out like three weeks into <laughs> moving it, moving out there. But it was like, all right, we'll take this. Um, you know, it was it was a great experience in that, you know, when they're not paying you regularly, um, that's not... <laughs> good but it also provides opportunity where yeah i've got a place that will pay me and but they're fairly loose on when i can come and go and so uh because you know what are they gonna say um so uh that was a cool experience it was uh, it was probably another really tough experience in that i was working probably 80 hours a week between the day job and doing church where i was doing installing phone systems doing it uh uh directing the live services um on on the weekends i was working in the production i was shooting videos i was doing literally everything uh and that was great but i burned out pretty within about a year i was i was toast uh i think we're out there three years total but um yeah it was maybe so maybe i have about two two good years in there and we did some amazing stuff i'm really proud of that 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 work as well uh, because they kind of gave us a budget and they gave us kind of, you know, hands off with whatever we wanted to do. So I ended up working with some incredibly talented people out there um, that knew how to do both music uh, and video and write story. And it was just it was it was a neat kind of uh, almost like a skunk works of of how do you do church production? You know, because we could just do anything we wanted to and come up with. Uh, That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's good stuff. So something that I hear you say, and I'm just wondering, is this. Is this part of your personality or just a situation you found yourself in? But it sounds like uh, workaholic would describe a lot of your early life. Is that yeah? Is that kind of how I, your brain's wired, or you just found yourself in those positions? No, I like doing. I like. I like. I'm, I'm a people pleaser. I think uh, first and foremost, I love making. I like. I like making people happy, mm. and I can do that. And when I have skills that I can offer up and give to people and like I, that betters their life, I love that. You know, I mean, if I could, if I could just do that and not have to worry about a paycheck, I would just be doing that. Uh, but, you know, the paycheck does unfortunately um, you know, come into play. So, yeah, I, I think I naturally like to keep myself busy. Um, gotcha. I think it's, it's how do you How do you moderate that? Like, how do you, how can you Oof. tell when you're doing too much of that or? It's well, yeah, I don't know that that's a uh, I mean, so I would say that's been a thing I've learned over the last 25 years of working. Right. I mean, it's is is realizing, hey, I need to find a good work life balance. And and I know I know Krista's she's an amazing wife because she's put up with me working 80 hours a week. She's put up with me, you know, just freaking out, you know, about trying to deliver things that I, you know, were on an impossible schedule or whatever. But um, 
but yeah, I mean, it's just something I've had to learn for myself. And I don't even know that I can, I even have words of wisdom for any one person because <laughs> it's so, it's so unique to who you, to who you are. Cause there are people who can, I mean, in my thirties, I could easily do an 80 hour a week for months on end. Now, Oof, I'm, I'm lucky if I can do 40. <laughs> so, so, no, I mean, that's I why you go to sales, on... right? So that you. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. You don't have to nose yeah. the guy. Sales somewhere. management, even better. Yeah. Well, you know what? I found stuff like that for me. Yeah. If I'm. I don't know. Yeah, you know, I like to say that I'm I'm the person in the movie, so I can't see what's happening, right? I don't have the script in right. front of me, but somebody else on the outside can look in and see it, and that's where Christie's always kind of stepped in for me because I, I think I share a lot of the same traits as like if I. If I can help people, I want to be of service to others. And I've let people take advantage of me plenty of times, way too many times. And Christy uh, recognizes that and protects me from those things. She's very, um, she's very astute. I don't know. She's, she's very perceptive when it comes to things like that. And so she, she sees it. She asks me about it in kind of interesting ways, um, you know, and uh, not necessarily warns me, but I can tell by her tone and her body language. She's like, you might watch out right here. Uh, yeah. doing this thing or that thing. And uh, I'm assuming Krista's done some of that for you as well, right? Very much so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah she's, she's good like that. We've got, after, you know, we've been married 22 years. Um, you just, you, you know, those codes, you know, those, those signals where you're like, okay, all right. She doesn't need to say it, but I, I need to you know, pack up here. Or I need to, I need to rethink what's going on. Do you feel like your relationship with Krista still kind of evolves a little bit over time? You guys still... Oh, constantly. Yeah. 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 And in great ways too. I mean, thank yeah. God. Cause man, I was, you know, I was not the easiest person uh, to get along with early on in life, but uh, just being so dogmatic, so driven. Uh, but she, you know, a lot of that she, just life and, and her wisdom has really uh, uh, helped kind of, you know, polish this big boulder of a person that i am to a yeah no kidding dude you're yeah. well, people probably don't i mean you can't obviously you can't tell if you're just listening or really just looking but you are like six eight and like uh yeah yeah i, I wasn't really going for the actual looks but yeah, yeah, you i guess are, i am kind of a polished stone now that... quite literally a boulder you are a huge <laughs> chunk of a man you are enormous chunk of a man yeah That's so it. it's uh i recently got you to play pickleball a couple of times with me and unfortunately yes Due to recent circumstances, we don't get to go out and yeah. play. But it is hilarious seeing you on the other side of the the net. It's uh, it's uh, definitely uh, an advantage for you being so goddamn big. <laughs> I, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh I man! It. So That's I cool. met you. I met you when you moved down to Texas. Um, yeah. I think you came down here to work for um, a company that does like some hosting and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, I think they really had very lofty expectations for your team and uh, yeah. very slim yeah. margins, slim deadlines. Uh, yeah. But you know what they say, no constraints, no creativity. So you guys were some of the most creative folks yeah. I've, uh, I've seen. So uh, yeah. Yeah. No, so that's actually where we went after, uh, after Utah, we came down here. Uh, we finally were like, well, where's home? And my parents had, had settled. Uh, they'd moved from Pennsylvania down to here. My dad works for uh, Texas A&M. So yeah, I, I, I uh, the the company you, you mentioned uh is is a great company i love every one of those people um it's uh it was a uh but it was it was definitely a lot of work there's a lot of work and uh, a lot of you know a lot of the revenue of that company came from the work we were doing uh, and it's finally when it was it, it was a blessing and a curse right and the minute you go from being support it to billable it the world changes right i mean it's it's all of a sudden now you know, you're you're actually a revenue generator instead of a you know a, a preventing loss of revenue, uh, or or trying to make uh, you know the the company work more efficiently, therefore you know, more money, uh, and that is where is where I've been for the last twelve plus years is in that in that role in IT. So, any kids out there listening, getting into IT, uh, definitely start kind of picking up on where 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 you can where you can make mo- make the company money because you become invaluable to them. Uh, you become uh, something that uh, you know you, you can work with computers still, but it you know, certainly uh, creates uh, a wave, a stickiness uh, for you. So yeah, you probably figured that out as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, well, I mean, uh, when I first got out of college, we were working. I, we, I mean, so Jimmy and I actually ended up working at the same place. That's how I. It's a, it's a small world in certain ways, and others not yeah. so much. But uh, yeah, Jimmy and I ended up working together there at this place called UCS and. Um, that was a very strange, I, I mean, it's, 
it's not you know it's like bizarre world over there so it's hard to, to compare it to the real world because it was very different um, and while we were a technology company and that was the product we sold the programmers were treated like royalty right because they were yeah. actually creating the product i guess and and all the rest of the infrastructure um yeah like like you said we were more a commodity we were more humans right. with barcodes quite literally because our name badges yeah. had barcodes and they would track how long we went to the bathroom and how often we went to the cafeteria um, and our managers would get um, reprimanded if their people didn't eat enough in the cafeteria because they would have to subsidize that. So it was, just, it was a really strange oh, place to work. Wow. But, but um, <laughs> it was also, they gave you a lot of liberty. So there was a lot of free time. Um, hmm. And back then there weren't, it doesn't seem like there was as many distractions back then. There was no Netflix. There's no Hulu, right? Right, and there right. Was, I guess at some point YouTube came along. But um, I don't know, you could either build yourself or jack around. Yeah. Um, and so you could definitely see the two sides of different people um, that actually would take advantage of it. I try to take advantage of it because I don't know, I, in work, I've always been a competitor, right? So mm -hmm. if there's somebody next to me, I'm going to try and get myself ahead of that person. So I'd always try and compete, compete, compete. Um, and eventually I got out of there. Thank uh, goodness. They used to call it UC high because you'd go there, you get your education then you would get out and go to a real How job. Funny. Somewhere. How <laughs> funny. But, um, but moving from there to another technology company, uh, there at the data center, there is, I mean, there's a division. There always has been between the salespeople and the IT people. And it seems so weird um, the way IT people tend to view sales folks, people over on the sales team, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's almost, you know, it's almost puts a bad taste in their mouth whenever they say the right. words. Um, but the more I started, and I think it's just because, you know, they assume that the sales folks are getting this enormous paycheck that they're not getting and all this stuff. But, you know, I mean, it's different skill sets, right? right. Yeah. If, 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 uh, if IT guys were okay with talking to humans and being able to relay um, complex concepts to normal human beings, then they would be over there doing that thing because, uh, right. you know, they'd be good at it and they're just not. And so um, it's just so funny to see how our perceptions of things change. And so now I love the idea of sales. I love the concept because it's another way to compete, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's yep. me, uh, almost against myself. I have to figure out the right words because in front of anybody, the right words can come out of my mouth and I'll get the desired result. And can I figure out what those words need to be? And right. I just love kind of the, the challenge of it. Yeah. You know, I mean, you're, yeah. you're turning the crank on the jack in the box and you never know what's going to pop out. You know, it's just, it's yep. like, I, I love the idea. Oh, it's a, it, I call it a high wire act. Yeah. Cause you just yeah. have no idea. And I, I think it's even more fun when you're the, I mean, I, I could, I don't know that I could ever be a sales guy. Like if that, where oh. I'm, I'm developing just, just the relationship. You're like pure commission I've got and a, stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I, I, um, even more so just the, what you're talking about, because I love technology so much that I, I don't know that I could ever walk away from. Being able to show because I, I when I go out and I sell or when I did, um, uh, it's I'm I, I always look at it like I'm I'm actually out there showing like a magic trick to somebody, uh, and then I get to show them how it works. Like oh, look look at this cool automation, and now let me show you how easy it is to do this because there's kind of that wonder of like oh cool you just like launched 15 machines and you configured them did all this stuff. Well now I get to show you like unpack that and say that's like this and it's like you know one one or two playbooks. So that, that kind of stuff is magical to me. If I yeah. didn't have that to be able to talk about, I don't know that I could just do the pure, hey, let me, let me, let's build this friendship relationship that really is only based on you buying something from me. Yeah. That to me, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm a little too transparent to be able to do that. So um, <laughs> that, is that a nice way of saying it? <laughs> but no, but, too, uh, too, it's, it yeah. I mean, it harkens back to what you said earlier is that you truly like to be of service to people. And so yeah. do I. And yeah. this is the way where I can show you, hey, what's something... What's something in your life that's bothering you? And I can genuinely, every time I step in front of somebody, say, "Yeah, this thing is awesome. It's going to help you. And I'm going to exactly show you. I'm going to show you precisely how it's going to help you. And I just, how could you not be excited to do that every day? Like that is, this is one of my favorite parts of my job. And now all of a sudden you came to me and you said, hey, how about you do that every day? It's like, how is that possible? Is that, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. I get so excited and i haven't been like i was telling people i haven't been excited to go to work in so long i can't even remember what the feeling is sometimes the the word takes a second for it to pop back in my head because it's so unfamiliar at this point but i am loving it i'm super stoked i can't wait i don't know how i i 
rat hole. I mean, just I, I came out of left field and, and turned it back around on me, which is not what this is about because I'm curious about you. So, but I, no, it's great though. So you, I, you I, went I from the, you went from there and then you went to Verizon Business, right? Yep. Yeah. So basically, that's where I met. I, I started meeting people uh, who we just for some reason because I wasn't moving. I think we just started pulling other people in, and so we've created this kind of like long chain of people who like you know this person will get a job then they'll bring bring all their people over you just find those people you just you love working with right um and uh and it's just kind of like oh well let's just make this happen you know like let's just get these people over because what it doesn't really matter what we do we just know that if we like working together and we're we you know we, we at least remotely like what we're doing it's gonna be great you know like i think when you get people with like-minded people like that who are just easy to get along with who just want again people pleasers who really want to get things done um and I think it's it's great. So that's that's what we've done. Did, went to Verizon Business. I, it's actually the longest place I've ever worked. Um, I, I essentially went from uh, a government hosting company to uh, doing essentially all of IT that I would normally do in a, in a single company. I'm now doing it for basically Fortune 50 companies. So I've worked with Lowe's. Uh, I've worked with American Airlines. Like all of their back-end engines. I should say most of the, their back-end in, engines I've, I've touched at some point or another. Uh, so... That, that was an amazing resume generating um, <laughs> a job because when you can say, hey, I built, I built the search engines, uh, the Indeca search engines out at Lowe's.com. So if you've been to Lowe's.com, you've searched something like uh, probably they've replaced them by now. But, uh, you know, that seven years ago, that was something I, I put in and, and installed. Um, that, that kind of stuff is, is pretty cool to be able to say. Um, and so that then helped me transition. After about seven years working from home, it was great. But... Um, Kind of that train of people went on to the next job, which was uh, which was Red Hat, and I never thought I'd be working for Red Hat. In fact, I remember a story back when I was working in visual effects, and I, I forget what it was. I was a FreeBSD guy at the time, and young and and you know, dogmatic. And uh, for some reason, I insisted we did something with FreeBSD, which caused a heck of a storm. But anyway, it's just funny that you know, 15 years later, you're now working for that company. You're like, man, I don't want to. Work with Red I, Linux. I was gonna say I think it's your fault that um, whenever I first started working at Fibertown, all the apartment complexes ran on free BSD servers. I think yes, that is probably my. I'm pretty fault. sure that is your fault because I think I injected. <laughs> I, I remember helping helping James yeah. get something set up, and then they just they just kept using that. Copy so, and paste, yeah, and yeah. then uh, it's like the one install of FreeBSD on this, you know, like in in Texas or something. Because West Coast, it's all over the place. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I remember uh, trying to transition to that was it was uh, not exactly the easiest thing for me coming like from a Cisco background, transitioning into yeah. free BSD and then yep. uh, trying to teach anybody else how to use it was nigh on impossible. And then uh, we stumbled <laughs> on this thing, Microtech, and we started, you know, <laughs> installing that over the top of the free BSD stuff. And then, oh, yep. oh my gosh, suddenly things got so much easier. Uh, so I, I, I yes. still know some, uh, some guys that are really into free BSD, like, uh, this guy, Tom Smith, he's quite the evangelist. He'll talk your ear oh, yeah. off about it, but, um, yeah. it's, so it's still alive and thriving and well, but it, oh, you yeah. know, talking about how it's kind of a small world, you're saying that everybody kind of follows everybody. So everybody went to Verizon business. And then after that, everybody yeah. went to red hat. And I remember when you went there, I was like, oh, that's cool. Cause like everybody in the world had, you know, if you're in it, you've heard of red hat. I right. like uh, my father-in-law doesn't know anything about it. And he's like, Oh yeah, red hat. I've heard of them. They were acquired huh. by IBM. So, you know, cause he's into yeah. stocks and all that stuff. Right. So it's, I mean, it's amazing name recognition. So just to be able to say you work there, I think is like super cool. But, um, Jimmy worked with him yeah. 2003 to 2005. So around there, well, to 2006. And then, uh, here I am going to be on the exact same team as him again. So, oh yeah, yeah. The small world, isn't it? <laughs> it all comes back around. It's yeah. so funny. It's so funny. Yeah, how I'm, I'm so I'm so thrilled we were able to make that work. That's like I I'm probably nowhere near as excited as you because, you know, but uh, it's it's going to be amazing. Yeah, it's going to be really cool. He's got an awful sense of humor, but you know nothing's insurmountable. Right. No human yeah. is perfect. Uh, right, right. <laughs> he's in the he's in the Slack, so the the patron only Slack we have, and he occasionally drops horrible jokes in there. Not not too frequent. He, I guess he doesn't want to alienate well, everybody at once, so he's easy. For, for a guy, yeah, for a guy who's not a dad, like he his dad <sighs> jokes are spot on. Amazing. Like it's, yeah, yeah. Maybe that's why he couldn't have kids. Um, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> just, right. You know, nobody his can, Jedi skills would be off the, off the charts. Yeah. 
<laughs> Nobody's dad jokes can be that strong. I mean, I would, right. I would fear for the safety of his children uh, at right. that point for exactly. their sanity. It would be pretty rough for their sanity. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. So that's a, you know, so throughout this, you've kept saying uh, we were looking for a home, looking for a home. Do you think you found it? Does this feel like oh, home yeah. to you? Yeah, yeah. It's it's weird because part of me, um, you know, I never thought I'd be in a you know small little town, uh, College Station, but uh, it's I, I love it. It really does feel like home. We've been here now twelve years. Well, it's, I can't do the math. I think it's twelve years. Um, but yeah, it's my parents are here. My brother's here. Um, it's we've just been here long enough. It just feels like home. We've we're, you know got friendships and you know people around us that we've known for. You know, probably longer than I've known a lot of other people in, in a lot of other, uh, other places. Um, so, yeah, this this definitely does. So. Yeah, I mean, your kids, like you said, you've been here 12 years. I mean, they've grown up here. This is what they know. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So this, is, uh, this is most of what they know. So I think I think once your kids are planted somewhere, that makes it feel a lot more like home, right? Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's so. cool, man. That's super cool. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I've, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot going on in the world. Uh, a no lot kidding. of things, and I thought I would, you know. So I, had, I had brought up to you the other day that I'd been contemplating uh, post-COVID handshakes, right? You know the idea of <laughs> yes. uh, when it's friendly, you do like a, you know, we're gonna start touching butts. That's what we're gonna do. So you know, with your friends, it's one cheek formal, it's two cheeks, cheek to cheek together, and then you kind of uh, each uh, elevate at different different times. Yeah. Uh, but then I was thinking, you know, maybe. Um, let's look to the animal kingdom, so we could do kind of like the orangutan, where we just beat on our chests or. Uh, uh-huh. I don't know. What, yeah. are, what are your thoughts? What, what should the uh, the next iteration be of a handshake? I don't know. I, I still think the idea of handshakes is such a foreign thing. It's so weird to me that like, you know, it's like I need I need to connect with you. And I I don't know. I mean, I, I guess it, you know, humans have to have that contact. And I don't know where I'd love to know where that actually originated from, because it's just such a just some odd that you. I need to touch this person. I think it really, it really does. I mean, they've done studies where like when you pet a dog, your blood pressure lowers, right? Just from yeah. like touching them and stuff like that. And then right. um, we used to do wedding photography, Christy and I. And so most of our business was actually generated at these bridal shows. And so we'd have like a, like a booth set up with all our pictures and stuff. And uh, when we first started doing it, you know, I would just, you know, again, I was still learning how to interact with other humans, um, right. you know, kind of at a fundamental level back then. Uh, that that had a lot to do with changing my personality, doing the wedding photography stuff. A, a lot, a lot to do. Um, hmm. But uh, I, you know, I would be very timid, and I would just kind of stand there, and I would wait quietly and patiently, and try and have a smile on my face. And you know, if somebody came up, I would try and engage. But you know what? I don't know where it came from, but I realized as soon as I saw somebody anywhere in my proximity, if I could take one step and get to them, I would stick my hand out, and I would hmm. shake their hand, and I was. It's just I don't know. It just forces you to engage with me and I would have a conversation and that's how we got a lot of our you know it's what even increased it more uh, so th- that's how we ended up getting a lot of people engaged with us and then booked ultimately was was via forcing them to kind of come and interact but if they had a guy with them which you know at these bridal shows it's mostly you know women their friends their mothers right. their you know whatever it happens to be it's not usually the guy the groom that's going to be there but if the groom was there what I do is I would reach out I would shake his hand and then I would compliment him visually on something. I would say, man, you got some really nice hair. Or, man, that shirt looks great on you, bro. You know, just something. Like I would yeah. compliment them something. And uh, I would say um, 75% of those people, if they would smile, you know, uh, right after that, we would end up signing those guys. So there's, I don't know, there's something wow. about making physical con- it's just i don't know yeah. i guess it's more intimate experience Draws people in. Yeah, yeah yeah no absolutely and there's that reciprocation it's like as humans yeah. we reciprocate so like if i tell you a personal story there's this social understanding that you have to you have to reciprocate you have to give me something right. back you know right just, right uh, uh I, I think i think there's something about our dna where physically touching people like that although there's other cultures that don't do that right like so yeah. so a lot of the asian cultures just bow or things mm-hmm. like that, and um, that works for them. But also, I don't know. Are are those Asian cultures? Are they? Um, I don't know. They're 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 very different from us. Yeah. I, I guess you know as, as far as social social interaction goes, and it seems like they're a lot more formal. I think mm-hmm. you're right. Unless uh, so, I I tend to um, 
I tend to shy away from small talk because it's boring. I try to go right for big talk, which is uh, <laughs> weird for some people sometimes, right? Yeah, so I'll just yeah. I'll start asking them very pointed, direct questions about all kinds of interesting things. Uh, so I've noticed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, this oh, is no, me. That's what I love about you, Greg. This is me with restraint. I don't know if you've noticed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but in person, I'm, a, I'm, you know, I'm generally a lot more open and uh, try and uh, ask very interesting questions. But you know what? I have zero problem answering any question, like yeah, ever yeah. Uh, of any right. kind, um, because I'm, I'm genuinely just a curious person, and I think people are fascinating because I, I can predict a lot of stuff. I can't predict people. They right. are right. so bizarre. You guys are weird, super weird. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I like all that stuff. Yeah. So I, I don't, I don't know what, what the formal greeting is going to be moving forward. Right. Maybe the whole idea of hitting elbows or something, is that going to stick? Well, I think, well, the, the whole fist bump thing, I think is probably the, the nap, the first one I think people will go to, uh, but now we're at such a heightened state of craziness that, yeah, I mean, I think people are not even, people don't even want to do any of that. So, but it'll be interesting to see how this evolves. Cause I, I really do think it will change quite a bit. Uh, of things of normalcy, you know, how, how we work, how we, you know, communicate. Uh, I've done more, I've done more video conferencing lately than, than I ever have. Um, whereas, you know, we, I'm, for 10 years I've worked from home, um, or worked remotely. And, um, you know, we at Verizon, we never turned on cameras. We were just on the phone and we just connected that way. Um, I should say we rarely did, um, here now. And really at, uh, at Red Hat, we, we don't, generally turn on, on cameras, but now that we're working so much from home, um, there's just kind of this, this lean towards, Hey, let's just get on cameras and talk. Yeah. So definitely it's interesting. Yeah. And to be honest with you, I was genuinely stoked about the opportunity to get in front of people and, you know, talk yeah. about this stuff. And, uh, but you know what? I, I think I was just so happy to transition over to Red Hat that it didn't really dampen my spirit very much because, mm -hmm. um, I feel like I'm ideally suited to this because I've been doing like the, the LinkedIn yeah, learning no and kidding. all the online yeah. education. I've been doing this podcast for like almost eight years now. So I'm, I'm very accustomed to talking to people in this fashion. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, yeah. it's like wow, it's like this virus is uh, specially designed just for me. Um, yeah. If there's any silver well, line. Well, it, it definitely came came across. I mean, everybody, you know, that was in the interview, you know, definitely your presence on, on camera was, was better than I think most uh, just because of your, your – your familiarity with it, the, the comfort of the format, you know, because we had to do that interview on camera. Yeah. Normally we would have done it in person and, <laughs> and it's, you know, re interviewing remotely for anybody is always, uh, always. A, Christy could hear me in me. here and she, oh, really? and she laughed at me when I came out. She goes, uh, you, uh, you transition a little bit into your uh, LinkedIn learning voice and a little bit of your podcast voice. She said you're a mixture of those it. two. So I, I'm very, <laughs> you've, got, you've got different voices. I, I do. It. Yes. My LinkedIn learning voice is, is, yeah, it's a very specific voice that I always use. It's, uh, it's, I don't know, man, it's just, you, um, you develop it. So in, in the, one of the first things they tell you in online education is speak slower, right? Because, oh, yeah. uh, not everybody's English is a first language. And, um, for me, I don't know, for whatever reason, I always associated talking fast with competence on the material like mm -hmm. if i can intelligently talk to you about a complex concept whatever it happens to be and i can do it at breakneck speed you're going to think yep. i must be such a smart guy but that's mm -hmm. not the case <laughs> that yep. is, that's absolutely not the case so that's and also whenever you get nervous you tend to talk faster too so yep. um that's something you got to kind of oh i don't know if i ever relayed this but when the, the very first time you do a LinkedIn learning course. So uh, I'll give you the, the 30 second version. So they contacted me based off my YouTube videos for like my Microtech stuff. There's this oh. guy, Jeff Kellum. He found me, he was over like their technical stuff at the time. And he's actually transitioned. He's like, he's pretty high up over there now. Um, but uh, he sent me a message through Facebook and I was like, Hey, I work for lynda.com. We'd be interested in, you know, we do this online learning stuff. We'd be interested in blah, blah, blah. So I replied back and said, sure, I'll talk to you. And then uh, he was, you know, kind of gave me the rundown. I was like terrified, but I was like, but don't worry, it's not going to happen. So I don't have to think about it. I was like, sure. Okay. Yeah. And he's like, okay, um, well, we want you to record like a five minute video of you explaining something technical with like some slides on screen and just, you kind of record your screen and, and download the free version of this, uh, this demo version of this Camtasia program. You can do that. I was like, okay, that'll work. Um, Cause it doesn't matter. Cause I don't have to do this. It's not really going to happen. So they do <laughs> right, that. Right. It goes to the panel and they're like, okay. Uh, 
we accepted you for this course. We want you to uh, produce this course and here's your producer and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, that's fine because it's not real. Um, <laughs> so that's great. It was just terrifying. Like I didn't like it was vague information on how to build all this stuff. And just anyway, I tried to do it as best as I could. And then um, they're like, OK, here's your plane ticket. You have to actually fly out to our studios because first time authors have to actually come to Carpinteria um, or Carpinteria. I always say it wrong. It's just uh, it's just north of L.A. Um, okay. Kind of on the coast. I think it's like 30 minutes away. So I, I would fly into like LAX. I've flown up there, I think, three times to do record. Anyway, they want you to do the first few up there. And oh, uh, wow. you can always go there to record. They don't care. Um, but it's more convenient for me, obviously, to record from my home. And, and now nobody's going up there to record. Um, right. Everybody's doing it early. But anyway, I get there and it was a terrifying experience. And uh, I'm sitting there in the uh in the room with a person and so i'm recording my very first one and you know i i get through it and uh it was awful and she stops me and says okay these are all the things we're going to fix these are all the things you did wrong in your course um all of these need to change and i just wanted to like shrink and die uh oh, because really? i'm not in my safety zone before i was always yeah. you know in my little area and i could put it on youtube and I was safe, but now I'm completely exposed, you know? And yeah. so, uh, I just wanted to go back to my hotel room and just fix everything and then come back the next day. And she's like, Nope, we're going to work through it all day long and we'll fix them as we go. And that was excruciating. But on the third huh. day when we were close to being done, she goes, okay, so I'm going to take this last one you just recorded and I'm going to take the very first one you recorded. I want you to listen to the very first one. And it was such an, I was like, I really don't want to do that. She's like, <laughs> she's like, no, 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 That's you so have great. to do this. She's like, I need you to see where you started and, and where you are now. I listened to it. I was talking so fast. My voice was like wobbling because I was just terrified. Mm -hmm. You could hear, yeah. you could hear the, you could smell the fear through the speakers. <laughs> I mean, it was awful. I was just, oh. everything about it was horrible. And then she played the one I had just finished and it was night and day. And, uh, really? I, I really saw the value in it when she made me do that. I didn't see it at first and I didn't want to hear it. And sure. it was so painful. Um, but yeah, it's so funny how, um, how just the repetition, I mean, having somebody who's done it a million times, uh, and, you know, and they, I mean, that's, that was, that was Ray's job and her name is Ray Hoyt. She, she is awesome. Um, I felt like at the end of that, like I had climbed Mount Everest. It was just so cool. Oh, and cool. she is like such a cool kid. And we still bull chive every now and then. Uh, so I've, I've been trying to arrange a way to um, get out there and see her just so I could hang out with her and Keith, her boy in there. It's just, uh, they're such cool people. Uh, I don't know, that LinkedIn and Linda, that stuff fundamentally changed me and the way I, I interact with mm. the world and uh, how I speak in front of people. It gave me so much confidence, but it really yeah. does. Like, so I slip into a voice. So it's, a, it's generally a deeper octave. Uh, I don't know why, but that's what I do. And then also you have to ham it up. They say, just when you feel like you're, you're stupid and you're hamming it up too much, do it just a little bit more. They said, because, really? yeah, because generally you can't see my face, right? It's just my screen mm. that you're seeing. So the only expression they get is through your voice, right? The, so much of what you get is this inner, and it, I mean, I'm always talking with my hands, uh, you're right. So it's, uh, and even when I'm in my sound booth and I'm recording, I move my hands. I'm gesticulating. <laughs> it's part of the process, you know, but, That's uh, funny, yeah. but yeah, so you have to ham it up. Uh, I don't know. I mean, since a lot of this communication has a camera, I don't know that hamming it up is necessarily uh, a good right. idea. That would probably just seem super weird, but, uh, <laughs> but also in there, there's, there's things you stay away from too. So when you do an online education, you don't say you, you don't say the word you, you don't say the word we. So like, uh, all right, now we're going to configure this router. They say no, because they may not be doing it along with you. It's just you doing it. So you say I. Also, you can't um, give a gender to anything. Mm. So uh, like the router, you can't call it a he or a she, right? It's an animal object. Uh, so there's just a lot of weird little quirks oh. that are in there. Fun times. Yeah. Yeah. I keep going down rabbit holes. But no, I love it. I, I, gonna, I don't know that I've ever heard you talk about that. Yeah, yeah so you're going to run into uh, a lot of that stuff, I'm sure. So uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm assuming I, I had thought ahead that whenever I started doing the Red Hat stuff, I was just going to make tons of this uh, material. And um, I'm assuming you guys may end up ramping up and doing some of that. So 
there's uh, some good tips for you to, to help you through it. Yeah, actually, that's that is something really important. I do want to start doing. It's we don't need to start talking shop, but um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's no, but it is. I mean, that's that is the thing that, that everybody you know in this world. I mean, like, how are we gonna? How are we? How do you sell? How, how do you sell free stuff when you're not meeting in front of people? You know, it's like um, it's that's really it's it's gonna it's gonna change how we think about things. That's why I really hope this thing just doesn't doesn't keep on, but. Yeah, yeah, me too. In, in case it does, we do need to know how to do that. Well, so. I want to get out there and play pickleball with uh, people in different places. No so kidding. I need to, uh, <laughs> we need to start yeah. getting out again. Um, that was part of the deal, right? Yeah, for sure. That was the package. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the things you said, uh, well, you know, you have to travel, you have to do this stuff. And I said, well, can I play pickleball when I go there? And I think Absolutely. you thought I was crazy when I first mentioned that. Well, I didn't know what it was. Yeah, yeah I didn't know what it was. Now now I'm like, oh, I, I get it. Yeah, you I totally get it. get it. So I even yeah. bought, I had bought some corrugated plastic, like you see on those uh, election signs that are out there mm -hmm. and I yeah. made kind of like a little case that I could put my paddle in so I could stick it in my carry-on just so it won't get oh, jacked nice. yeah okay. I bought enough I'll make you one it'll be great oh cool yeah you gotta look nerdy so uh, one of the things I uh, had mentioned to you prior to coming on here is something that I've only been doing for about a year and a half now but something you've been doing for an exceptionally long time and that is working from home and so there's a plethora of people that are doing it for the first time and there's tons of people yeah. giving their facts and their ideas and uh different ways of doing it so i thought um maybe we could share ours because everybody's got kind of a unique perspective on it yeah. on uh the best tips so i'll go first that way it yeah. doesn't seem like i'm copying you uh it'll right, seem like right. you're copying me when you <laughs> <laughs> see how this is i see how uh, it is. but i know so for me um a really big thing is this this room i'm sitting in i have a dedicated space so this is my quote-unquote office not everybody's got that luxury right so right. you know some of these people are gonna be locking themselves in the closet or you know in the laundry room to try <laughs> try and get away from their kids and all yeah. that stuff uh just so they can have a, a phone conference without being interrupted but to me it's i don't know it's like um it's like my brain switches when i walk in here right like i can mm -hmm. work um although i do play in here sometimes too you know if i'm working on a project or whatever just kind of having fun um let's see i would also say another big one for me is following a normal routine so I work, uh, I wake up just like I would if I'm driving my butt into the office, maybe not as early because uh, I don't have to worry about traffic and stuff like that. But uh, right. that one's an important one for me, you know, get up, make sure you shave, you know, yeah. do the normal yeah. things, pretend like you're really going to an office. Um, but also I dress like I'm going to work. Well, I say that normally if I ever go into an office, I'm wearing slacks, nice shoes and a button up shirt. I'm not going to wear that when I come in here and work, but I put on jeans and I put on an undershirt, like, you know, like one of my black ones, like I'm, you know, going to go to a, so I, you know, hmm. I try and kind of follow a routine of sorts, you know, if yeah. I can, you know, so not just sit in here in a, in my PJs. Cause I don't know. It just, I don't know. It was part of like putting on a uniform that makes me feel like I'm going to work you know I'm kind of yeah. I'm switching mental gears I'm not sure if that kind of is the same for you or not yeah I think initially um so so first of all well well played because you just took the top two that I was going to say in your face uh, but I will expand on those uh because I think I think there's more nuance to that for sure but yeah uh, so the first one um absolutely having a space you can go in and out of um uh, to be able to sh when you're working at home one of the biggest things is you are not you go from a mode of, you know, you're driving sometimes 10, 20, 30 minutes, two hours if you're in L.A. Um, <laughs> so there's a process of getting to work. By the time you're there, you're ready to work. Um, and I think the same thing, you're, you're able, at the end of the day, you're able to decompress. When you're at home, you know, if you don't have your own space where you're you're leaving work behind, you end up taking that with you. Now, that's that's changed, I think, over the last five years. I've been working from home for 10 Um and the more and more now that we have cell phones and the people are and more and more people are working from home and working out of hours, um, there's just kind of an expansion of, well, you know, you can kind of do work in, in anywhere. Um, I generally try not to do that. In fact, right. I just had an interaction with somebody the other day. I was like, hey, you know, somebody was asking for time for my, you know, an update for my team on a Saturday. And I'm like, I saw it. My other guy saw it. Like, it just kind of takes you out of turning off for the weekend. Right. Um, so I'm just to expand on that. I just think the ability, you know, to, to turn off, uh, and also kind of you know, just walking away from work and leaving it in a place yeah. is huge. I'm like you, I, I have my own space. I actually built a building for my, for my office. Um, and it's very, for me, it's that walk back up to the house where I'm like, okay, I'm turning this off yeah. now. 
do, do I always do it? No, but uh, you know, because I always got my phone with me. But, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I love the idea of that I've I've called my phone for the last forever my digital leash, because mm-hmm. as long as I've yeah, got it, really it I never can get away from work. And and for the longest time, I had problems not constantly checking my work email all yeah. the time. Um, yeah. And I've kind of reconciled that. Uh, you know, I've uh, there was about yeah eleven about 11 years ago when Christy went in the hospital and came out, I reevaluated everything. And that's when I really started making those shifts um, for me. Uh, and I think it's, you're right, man. It is so hard for people to disconnect nowadays, especially when you're in like yeah. a high stress IT job where you're always on call or, yeah. you know, you've got plates spinning in the air. So I, I, I guess figuring out well, that balance is going to be tough for some people. Yeah. And I think, I think it's tough sometimes because we all know that if you don't, do that Monday morning, you're going to be dealing with a whole bunch more work that's compounded because now you've got that week's worth of work plus everything that happened over the weekend. I just think it's, it becomes a culture that you need to foster, you know, in, in, in and amongst the company. So I, the person who actually you know reached out to me, I actually wrote him back and said, Hey, do you mind, you know, here, here's the answer to what you're looking for. But hey, if you don't mind, can you just set these to send, you know, cause Google has the ability to send at a later date. So you just go and click that button and say, schedule it. And so I, I've been doing that more and more because quite frankly, it, it's two things. A, it doesn't bother the other person, uh, especially when I don't need the answer over the weekend, but B it's at the top of their email box. Cause I set it for 8 AM on Monday morning. And like my emails, you know, basically I send out 10 emails on a Monday morning at 8 AM. And so I'm getting immediately when I get to my desk, I'm getting answers that I wanted versus having to chase people down who may have missed it, you know, getting, uh, buried by other email over the weekend. So, you know, and, I don't know. Two something else that pops in my head is when you're talking about is the way humans make associations between things in their brain. So, like mm-hmm. if you uh, if you go to AA, one of the things they tell you is don't hang around the people you used to drink with, you know, or mm-hmm. use drugs with, and don't go to bars, right? You know, it's like right. like disassociate yourself. And I've heard about people who they'll be clean for 20 years, and then they'll run into an old friend that they used to get high with, mm-hmm. and then they'll right. relapse. You know, it, there's something about this this correlation in your brain that you make between objects or people or situations, you know. And so yeah. if you make your home, like your living room, part of your work, it's like it's probably going to be hard for your brain to kind of disassociate, decouple mm-hmm. the two of those things, right? You really do need that separation where you can let off yeah. steam and, and not feel like you're always working because, man, that is going to... I think in IT, that's one of the biggest killers is burnout. Um, yep. That and um, difficult managers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because no kid. Most people don't tend to to leave a job; they leave a manager, right? And uh, those people that do leave the job in IT, a lot of times, it's well, I mean, sometimes it's because there's a lot more money around the corner, but a lot of yeah. times it's just because there's too much stress and they can't yep. they can't get away from it. It's just killing them. Yeah. No, absolutely. Man, that's absolutely. tough. So another yeah. tip I have is. Get a, if you can, and it's possible, get a hard desktop VoIP phone. I I don't know. There's something about, I come to my office hmm. and I sit down at my desk and I have a hard VoIP phone. I love talking on that compared to a cell phone. Cell phone, my signal is always spotty. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's not. And I hate that inconsistency. Um, hmm. And to me, it just, it feels um, certainly annoying when you're trying to talk to somebody and they're they're going in and out. But also, if, if my phone's doing that and you're on a cell phone, I mean, that's a recipe for disaster. We're both going to have a yeah. bad time. But if you've got a right, hard right. VoIP phone where I can hit the speakerphone button and I can talk to you and you're going to at least hear me crystal clear and I'm going to hear you as best as I possibly can, I definitely recommend it. And I don't know, man. It just makes it feel – I pick up that phone and I, like work. I feel more professional when mm-hmm. I'm on that hard phone. I don't know what it is. It's just yeah. some weird switch in my brain that flips, but it makes me – I don't know. It puts me in that yeah. – and that professional, so that's, that's a that's a big one for me. I like that. Interesting. Yeah. So I, I don't know that I can do that just because I walk when I'm talking. I just I'm I'm walking. <laughs> so it's like I would I, I don't know if I could if I could could deal with it. That must um, be hereditary because James used to burn a path down in the knot. Oh yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I mean, what's <laughs> yep. What's funny is like so I'm out here on 20 acres and there have been times I've been on calls where I'm just walking. I'm just like. <laughs> And next thing I'm like, oh, Justin, can you take a look at this document? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm like three acres away from my desk. Hang on. I'm like (laughs) booking it back. So, yes, I'm sure it's a sight. Uh, Give me 10 minutes. 
Yeah. Let me tell you exactly. <laughs> Why are you putting all that sunblock and that hat on? I've got a phone conference in five minutes. I gotta, <laughs> exactly. Gotta make sure I don't yeah. burn. Put, put, put my running shoes on. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. hilarious. Another one for me is there's a lot of people that are uh, required to go through VPNs, right? For one thing or another. I know a lot of people are saying, well, you know, everything's moving to online cloud base. And while, while that's true, um, if you're uh, traditionally like a network engineer, like I have been for what feels like most of my life, um, yeah. generally you can't go through the cloud to get to your network. Uh, you're going to go through some secure method to getting access to your infrastructure and then you can connect in and do stuff. So, um, for me, I don't like using VPN clients on laptops or desktops. I actually like to have, so I've got a dedicated router that sits here at my desk that, um, has a radio that wi fis back to, so I've got, I've got two five gigahertz radios in my, <laughs> in my home access point. I'm a weird, I'm that guy. Um, and so yeah. I've got a dedicated radio that just for my desk, I connect in. And so like my desk phones run off this thing. Uh, my laptop connects in here. So I actually do VPN clients through my router on my desk. So I much prefer to have those. So I will VPN over to that customer. I'll have one set up to all these various people. And, uh, you know, I just do selective routing on my network here. So I never have to like dial up a client. I don't have to fight with the client. I don't have to do any of that crap. I don't have to, uh, Oh, when I'm connected to this client, I can't get to these resources. All this stuff is dumb. So I don't have to fight with that stuff. So I really like having, uh, my router actually just automatically be VPN in. And as soon as I crank so is my it, laptop is it a constant point to point that's interesting i've never heard anybody who does that is that a constant point to point or is it is, is it connecting up on your behalf to get to those networks yeah yeah, you're yeah. yeah yeah so uh, basically like um uh a lot of the customers are like sstp um gateways so mm -hmm. uh i just connect in with my microtech via sstp or if it's an ipsec i can create an ipsec tunnel or if it's l2tp i can do that or if it's pptp i mean basically yeah. it's going to terminate it virtually any tunnel type you're going to see um, off of most people's equipment. So I yeah, just yeah. have it dial up. I create firewall rules that prevent anybody from coming into me. And uh, I only have routes in there for their select networks. And when I need to, I'll just pop up a browser and I'll log into their equipment, do whatever I got to do, close the browser and, and Bob's your uncle. I don't have to think. Wow, that's really cool. I really like it. It's made me yeah. so much more efficient. Cause I just, you know, it's like, say you've got four or five customers with all the different VPNs, instead of having to disconnect from this one, connect to that one, do a thing back and forth. I can just always have them live. Um, if I need to, I can just have them disabled, but it just makes things so much simpler that way. Oh, that's really cool. I have to investigate that. Cause I, I've got, I do have that problem. I've got several, I've got two computers, different types of clients and it's messy. Mm -hmm. Unless you've got like, um, like a, a client specific. So, I mean, some hardware has clients that really only work with their stuff. And I mean, I guess in that instance, you don't, you don't have any options, but uh, right. I like it when I can. So what do you do for um, background noise? Like, so a lot of people are accustomed to being in a, an environment where there's other humans and noises and stuff like that. What do you, what do you do for yeah. that? So, well, I mean, that's, that's quite frankly why I built uh, a specific building to be my office, uh, because it, I knew I needed it to be away from uh, the rest of the family. Because I, I worked in the house at one point while my family was trying to do homeschool. And I'll tell you what, it was, it was not a good recipe because, you know, the kids are running around, uh, you know, having fun, you know, just doing a great, having amazing childhood, right? But, uh, you know, when dad's kind of yelling at them because they're running through the house or whatever, it's like, that's not cool. So I finally, uh, you know, uh, several years back built this. And it was just like, OK, I need I needed my own space for the reasons I listed before, as well as that background noise. Um, but a lot of times um, I'm the king of the mute button because I really I'm, I'm very cognizant of when people are on a call with me and they don't mute. So I try like that's my my gift to the call is me being on mute. And uh, <laughs> so, you know what I mean? Because it's it is so jarring sometimes when um, uh, when people when there is that background noise. In fact, we were just on a call the other day and, you know, you guys were giving, getting a good laugh because I was walking up my gravel driveway. And nobody knew what that sound was. And I'd realized I'd left myself. Yeah, it sounded like you were eating potato chips. Yeah, it was interesting. Eating potato chips. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, what about people that are accustomed to that noise and all of a sudden they're in a quiet room and it's driving them crazy? What would you suggest for that? What's your go to? So you mean trying to work in an environment where you need just kind of some, some noise? Yeah, you need something. Or, what, yeah, what they, what so I, I actually do that every so often. Um, I, I, I'm the same way. I, I love music. 
uh, and I I'm don't generally like working in, in silence. Um, so a lot of times I've found, um, actually one of my best friends um, basically suggested, like, just, just play some like meditation music, something that doesn't have like a beat or doesn't have, um, uh, you know, just is, is kind of just slow and quiet, just kind of quiet yourself because I found myself getting more amped up. I'm drinking coffee in the morning. I'm going, going, going. And I'm, I realized I'm like, I'm adding stress to my life, which is taking time off of my life. So I'm like, I just need to slow and find, find that, that <laughs> quiet, you know, just some, some kind of thing that'll bring me down a little bit just to, uh, uh, you know, lessen, lessen that stress. So that's been really huge in doing that. I do that when I travel too. If I'm stressing out, uh, flying different places, I'll just put, you know, meditation music on and, and uh, go from there. That's cool. I haven't really tried that one for me. Like yeah. if I'm, um, if I'm working on something where I really need to focus and, uh, you know, concentrate or I'm doing a lot of research on something. I like, I like music, you know, so I'll put on some music in there. Um, but if I'm not, can you do it though with, with, uh, with lyrics? Uh, I usually listen to, uh, electronic music, yeah. so there's not always a lot say. of lyrics. <laughs> Just, yeah, it kind of yeah, yeah, depends. Gotcha. Uh, it doesn't usually bother me too much because after working in that knock for, God, I think I was sitting in there for like 11 years. I just got used mm. to people constantly talking and I just learned yeah. to block it up. Well, you know what I say that after having kids, I learned to block a lot of people out. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the truth. Yeah. That's um, it. Yeah. No, but, uh, also for me too, like, um, if I'm not doing that, if I'm not like concentrating, I'm just, you know, just kind of doing normal tasks. I like, uh, human voices. So I, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of times what I'll do is I'll have podcasts running where, you know, I'm just kind of halfway paying attention or I'll put on like, um, uh, a Twitch stream where it's somebody, that just talks a lot and I'll minimize it. I don't even have it up. I found uh, I, I definitely don't have YouTube videos going where I can see them because that is yeah. super distracting and I will, I will drift <laughs> over. All or, sort of, yeah, yeah, or if exactly. somebody's playing Twitch and I have it up, I'll drift over towards it. So it's, yeah, the podcast is probably the best compromise of still hearing some humans, um, but having the least amount of distraction associated with it. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I found a good chunk of what I do as, as a manager now is, is I'm, I'm sending and processing emails and I, it's just gotten to the point where I, I can't have voices on because I'll start typing what they're saying because <laughs> the voice in my head is, you know, not, not as uh, strong, I guess. I don't know, but it, uh, so yeah, I've, I've had, that's why I've gone away from that. Uh, if I'm trying to, back in the day when I was actually writing code, if, throw some EDM on and I could just be cranking all night, you know, just like, just that could focus me. These days, for whatever reason, I need kind of just to be down a little bit uh, because I'm so amped sometimes. So, um, yeah. So, anyway, interesting. Hmm. Different, different uh, solutions. So, since we've all been um, locked in our houses as uh, as we're supposed to be, what uh, what's some of the media stuff that you've been uh, binging? Everybody's been binging stuff. What are you What are you into right now? Oh. Um, a couple of different shows that I have, have been cranking through, uh, probably my top one, I don't know if anybody's watching it, is Devs, uh, which is on FX, which you can stream on Hulu. Uh, it is a fantastic show, uh, reminiscent for me of Lost, uh, hmm. except that you don't have all those filler things, uh, far less uh, of, a, of an ensemble cast. Um, there's about, I don't know, seven or eight characters in it. Just really cool. It's a high, basically a high-tech company that has this weird development group. Um, that's in this hyper hyperbaric chamber that, or vacuum. And it's just super nerdy, but also super weird. Uh, great, like, ambiance music. Um, so the, they'll make these weird, like, it's, I don't know, it's very, very interesting and moody. And so definitely but my top pick. If you've not, I also can see it as being a show that you either love or you hate. Mm. Uh, so it's that, I, I, I like the risk in that. Um, I think today there's so many shows out, so many movies definitely that are just like, let's paint with as broad of a brush as we possibly can. That just means like mediocre to everybody. Right. right? And so I kind of like when somebody's taking a risk and doing, you know, like I said, really weird music or weird sounds that are jarring to get you to kind of emote with what you're seeing. Uh, and that's definitely this show. So hmm. yeah, that one's, that one's good. Another one's uh, travelers, which is more, uh, it's more kind of hokey time travel, uh, to Canadian sci-fi a la, um, Stargate uh, or uh, SG-1 or um, what are the other shows that have come out of up there. Um, just kind of like science fiction that doesn't take itself too seriously. There's, you know, so it's, I mean, it's fun. It's a, it's a good show. What would you liken it to? Is it kind of like, uh, like Quantum Leap sort of thing where you're zipping uh, around? Not, yeah, Doctor well, Hillish? it's more, it's, it's more that the, 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 um, 
the premise of Travelers is that these are people from the future going back, almost like Terminator, trying to fix the future. So they're coming back to people right before they're about to die, and they it, they take their body. The the the, the Sounds like reason quantum being, leap. yeah, kind of uh, in that. Um, not as hokey. When I think of Quantum Leap, I'm kind of like, ah, okay, this is kind of, you know, Scott Bakula being silly and, and you know, hey, he came back as a woman. And, and in this case, some, sometimes it does happen, but they're, they're, that's not like the main plot point. Uh, they basically are trying to, you know, make the, the future better. And what's running it, you you know, it is, is this AI from the future that, that tells them how to... Uh, uh, what to do and what missions to go on. So it's it's pretty it's amazing in the beginning. It kind of gets formulaic as they as they go on, uh, but it's 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 worth a watch. I mean, it's only th- three or four seasons. So. Oh, that's cool. I might check it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think Devs is only going to be eight eight episodes if I read it right. Um, and so that one that one to me is I, I kind of like that one because it's it's like okay cool here's this world beginning middle end and we're done. It's like like a long movie. Um, and it's so they're not kind of wasting time with things in there. So. Yeah. That's cool. Well, let me tell you some of the stuff I've been uh, watching. Please. And uh, so there's a couple of UK guys that always give me hell when I talk about like the Great British Bake Off and how much I enjoy that stuff. Because <laughs> I guess it's trash to them or whatever. But I don't care. So on the UK Channel 4 stuff I've been watching, there's a show called Last Leg. They're on hiatus for a little bit right now. But it's kind of like um, a weekly news recap. And I just started watching it like three weeks ago. And unfortunately, I caught it right when Corona started. So that's all it's really been about is COVID unfortunately, but it's, uh, it's basically like three comedians and then they have some guests on and they're just cracking wise the whole time. And, um, why did Christy relay it? She said, if all news was like this, I would finally watch the news. So it's, uh, it's a really comedic way to, to uh, enjoy the news again. It's got, um, God, what's that kid's name? I can't remember. Anyway, it's pretty good. There's only like, you know, like 30 total British actors, Uh, And they're in everything. And so a couple of these guys are, you know, in a lot of the different Josh, that's the guy's name, Josh. Uh, So he's got a show called Josh. Oh, Josh. Yeah. Josh. Yeah. I can't remember what he's got a show over there on. uh, I think it's on the BBC, uh, like on the BBC iPlayer that's called Josh. And there's several seasons. It's pretty enjoyable. Uh, Also, there's one called Friday Night Dinner. And it's, uh, Mm -hmm. it's these two. Uh, it's this Jewish family and the two kids come home every Friday and eat dinner with their parents and shenanigans ensue every time. And they just started the sixth season of that, which mm. is bizarre because nothing ever makes it past three seasons over there, except for Dr. Oh, Hay, yeah. right? Except, except for Dr. Yeah. Hay. yeah. <laughs> so they, uh, and that started Friday, Friday, they aired the, the first one. So, um, huh. it was really nice. I, I love the idea of that because there's just a, a handful of shows that I really like over there, and that one's really enjoyable. Uh, let's see what else. What, why do you like that? I'm, I'm actually very curious. I remember you mentioned this the other day, and I thought oh, that's so Dude, odd. That- I could rattle off so many shows over there that I love. Um, I'm not. But why? Uh, you- I'm not 100 percent sure. I'm 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 not <laughs> entirely sure why I enjoy it so much. I think, I mean, there's all the cliche stuff. Like uh, a lot of times they don't spell out all the jokes, right? There's right. the assumption that you're going to know. So I mean, that's true. Um, I like a lot of the, smart television. I like a lot of the humor. Just. Uh, yeah. It's just, it's, I don't know, it's my kind of uh, cerebral joke a lot of times, but then they mix in a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, what do you call that? Where there's people bonk each other and stuff like that. Less so physical stick. comedy? Yeah, physical comedy. Yeah, so that yeah, stuff yeah. is in there. Um, and also they have a bit of cringe. I don't like the ones that are completely full on cringe because that stuff kills me. But uh, when there's a bit of cringe, because Christy will see the look on my face, and then that makes her enjoy the show that much more right. uh, when she sees me uncomfortable. So there's just a lot of that stuff. That's fantastic. But man, there's so many shows over there that I love. Um, you know what? I So there's one called Great British Poetry Throw or not poetry, Pottery Throwdown, uh, where they're mm. like making pots. It's kind of in the same formula. It's not that great. I just thought I would mention it just because I know, I know the guys, <laughs> over there, out, yeah. they, the guys over there I get so tired of me talking good about it. I think this one's bunk and it's boring. Um, mm. with sewing bee, the great British sewing bee should be back on soon. And that one is quite enjoyable. Same formula as bake off, but they're like making outfits and stuff. Uh, wow. I learned what a dart was. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm missing out. You are dude. I feel like I just, there's so much, yeah. but like comedically, like I was talking about probably, one of my favorite shows of all time is called Taskmaster over there. And, uh, they, yeah, they just finished the ninth season not so long ago. And then there's champion of champions, but it is 
so enjoyable. You've really got to pop in there. I would say I think okay. season six is probably my favorite of all. So if you pop in there, you watch one episode, you'll pretty much immediately know whether you love it or, or don't, if yeah. it's for you or not. But it is, it is so enjoyable. But also something I found is that I still really like Seinfeld. I st- oh, yeah. I still really love it. Like, we've yeah. been... Uh, Christy's been having it on for background noise. And so I'll pop in there and watch a couple of, we were watching a couple of episodes before we recorded this thing. I just forgot how good that show is. You know, the interaction, yeah. like, I don't know how they could have cast those characters any better. You yeah, know, but no, absolutely. Between George absolutely. Kramer, Elaine, just the chemistry between all of them and the characters and situations. It's so well done. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cause there's a lot of stuff that just does not hold up. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, to me, that's one that, that certainly still does are you still yeah. are you still playing games anymore you still do that what kind of what games like, like, like uh video games? yeah the video games you still do that yeah yeah i'm kind of going throwback days uh we just set up a minecraft server because my we're home now and so it's like oh let's let's find ways to like interact with the kids because they like we try to do like let's sit around the, the and play board games and they're just they're wanting to go like a million miles faster than that we'll, we'll do it every once in a while but 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 I know if I go into into the world that they're working in, it's like that's even more fun for them because I'm not making them you know come play Monopoly or whatever, you know, show them you know uh, capitalism. Uh, <laughs> I know I can I can go in and we'll just you know, we'll build stuff. So I set up a Minecraft server and then I got bored of just doing the Minecraft. So I was like, you know what, I need to go back and do because I love spaceships. I don't know if it's evident in the, the amount of sci-fi I like, but. Uh, it's why, actually, it's why I got into visual effects. Is I love spaceships. And to the point that I'm, I literally, to my friends, I'm Benny from uh, the Lego movie. You know, the guy's screaming spaceship and running around. Um, <laughs> that's that's me. So uh, we end up playing a, a game that's just like Minecraft, except in space, which is called Star Made, which is really fun because you can build spaceships and actually create, like, guns on them that f- kill things. And it's pretty cool. So, so it's an infinite universe Minecraft. That's cool. So, have you been Super to like fun. the uh, Air and Space Museums in um, mm-hmm. DC? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it's good stuff. Was that pretty amazing? Yeah, I went there as a kid. Um, yeah, it was absolutely. I mean, I, and, and even we, I, more impressive, I think, is going down to um, League City. Um, League City, is that right? Yeah, where the where they've got the Saturn V rocket and the, the um, all the other. Have you ever been down there? Mm-mm. You had to have gone. Oh my gosh, you've gone to Moody, but you've never gone to uh, yeah the the nasa space center down there um and they've got they literally have one of the saturn V rockets sitting on its side and and it's just incredible to walk around it and realize how freaking big that how thing is um, and realize what it took to get up in outer space so they'll let you go into the original mission control and and see that and it's just it just blows your mind from a, you know from an it perspective a technologist perspective um to realize like what we did with like a calculator you know what i mean like it just the the processing power that is in that room or was in that room um, to to do what they were doing, you know, it's it's just incredible. So I I don't know what the actual compute ability is, but I got to think that like a Raspberry Pi probably runs circles around what was yeah. in that entire room. I'm sure it's so. less than uh, less than the power in the uh, the Apple Watch you're wearing on your wrist right now. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's incredible, and it's it's just it just and it it's amazing what they were doing with, you know, slide rules and just pure people smarts, right? Human smarts, what they were able to do. So, uh, yeah, anyway, so I, that, that to me, I think is even more insp- impressive because the, the, uh, shoot, from what I remember, the airspace, uh, it was more kind of like, Hey, look at these neat airplanes. And yeah, things yeah, like yeah. That. That, that was neat. And I'm sure they've updated it now. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. We so went last know, summer but, and there's, um, there's okay. some stuff that's so, been to space that you get to walk through, like physically oh, walk through and touch. And it's pretty neat. That's cool. Yeah, that's really cool. And then they have yeah. the uh, the original Wright flyer that's in there too. Yeah, that's neat. That's pretty that's, cool. That's impressive. It's super trippy to think about from like the the time frame of when we had the first powered man flight. Because I remember talking to my kids about this from the time we had the first powered man flight to the first time we went to the moon was within a human's lifespan. Yeah, you know, it's just, just it's just it's so it's impossible for me to imagine. Uh, that leap of technology in such oh, yeah. a short amount of time. Yeah. And, you know, it's, I don't know, you know, stuff like that gives me a lot of hope, you know, whenever stuff's getting sideways, you know, right, I don't right. know, maybe like right now, you know, just <laughs> how humans are survivors. That's what we've always done. And we're so clever and curious and we can make, 
you know, we can MacGyver anything out of anything. And uh, it's just, I don't know, just the ability for a man to always succeed. Even when you think he can't, we always figure out a way. And so just, Mm -hmm. you know, I I like to hang on to to stuff like that. It keeps me sane, I think, sometimes. No, it's, it is. It's, it's, it is impressive uh, what we've done in the I mean, shoot, just in, in since I was born. I mean, it's like what what how things are compounding and how things are you know uh, exploding in, in in every aspect. Uh, we we do amazing things. We invent amazing things all the time. Um, I think I think one of the things I've I've uh, that's I've wished for, and I hope this COVID thing is not uh, is not what's going to be the thing that brings us together. But I go back to that, that moonshot. I mean, that really brought our nation um, really together. Um, unfortunately, you know, also in, underneath the guise of the Cold War right. and trying to you know, beat the Russians. But we, we haven't had a sense of unity, in, in had, especially nowadays with, with such you know, di- polar opposite sides would be running away from each other and, and finding their, their group to, to basically uh, you know, be anti of something. Yeah. I, I've wanted something that would bring us together. And that, that's, that's like that moonshot, like something that would be like, hey, let's all do this together because we're so much more powerful, so much more. We can do such more amazing things when we're doing things together uh, and not you know, fighting among ourselves. Well, I've always so. heard nothing brings a people together like a common enemy. And yep. I guess right now the whole world has a single common enemy that they're all yep. focusing on. So, yeah. I mean, from that perspective, I've, that's definitely true. Yeah, I've often thought that, you know, I mean, I'm not one who, who is an alien guy, but but something on that level of like, oh, there's an imminent threat to Earth that then brings us to like, hey, we need to work. We need to find a way to work together. You know, we don't have that motivation right now. You know, talking about space, there was an astronaut. I, I don't remember who it was, but I, I was watching a video and they were talking about how and there's actually a, a term or a phrase coined for this specifically. And I've mentioned it before, but I can never remember what the term is. Um, mm. But it's it's this this epiphany, this realization that virtually every astronaut that goes into space and they're they're away from the Earth and they look out the window and they see the earth they have this this mm. sense of we're not american canadian african um, we are just yeah. humans right because all yeah. of a sudden the earth is just this little ball out yep. the window and so it just really i know it's perspective right that mm-hmm. that unfortunately you can only get if you sit on a giant you know bomb and fire yourself into space <laughs> yeah uh, and yeah. not everybody gets the opportunity to do that but it's Right. I don't know. It's it's interesting. So it's like, yeah, it's like, what do you do to give everybody that moment of clarity where they, they mm-hmm. see things, you know, as, as we are a people? Um, yeah. If this isn't it, I don't know what is. I know there's a lot of people that are trying to label it like the Chinese virus or, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> it's like trying to assign blame to right. uh, uh, something that's microscopic that you can't even see. Um, yeah, yeah. That doesn't think or feel or, you know, it's just... It's a virus, yeah. and it's yeah. everybody's enemy. We should just unite against it, and mm-hmm. maybe um, get a little sense of community out of it. Hopefully, yeah, that's my hope. You got you got to make lemonade out of, out of lemons at some point. Now you got to whip, the, the, like you got to weaponize the, the lemons. Stuff. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fire them back yeah, at definitely. at life. Oh man! Mm-hmm. All right, dude. Well, we've hit an hour and a half, and I've burned you down. Cool. Wow, that flew by. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. All right, well, well, thanks for having me on. Yeah, do you have any uh, any parting wisdom? Oh, I don't know that I ever have wisdom. It's just. I don't know. Is that right? Yeah. No, no. Nothing. <laughs> I, I wish I did, man. All right. <laughs> no. All right. Well, good times. Great. Well, if for some reason you were uh, you were so inclined and you wanted people to find you out on the internet, how would you how would you have them do that? What's the best method? You know. That's so funny you should say that because I just realized I have so many domains that I had just let sit idle. Um, shoot, I don't know that I've got anything to promote other than, um, uh, you know, LinkedIn. Yeah, page. I was going to say they I mean, could find you on LinkedIn. Hey, fine. Oh, yeah, if you wanted to find, absolutely, LinkedIn is, is the way to go. Uh, I don't know if I have a link that we can put up, but I'll give it to you. We'll probably put a graphic under there. <laughs> but, uh, no, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely find me on LinkedIn. That's probably the most current thing. Um, but, um, yeah. And if you search for Cyberdyne, that's C Y in my last name. It's it's uh, that's that's me out there. All right, rock and roll, man. If you want to find me, I'm Greg at gregsoul.com, the normal places. Also, you can find the normal uh, podcast where we always list this stuff at thebrotherswisp.com. Um, you know, I'd always kind of 
second not always but recently i've been second guessing the idea of putting brothers in the name it's like is that is that you know it was always supposed to be a play on like the brothers grim uh you know but uh wireless isp focus and now it's kind of been it's sort of migrated into just general it as a whole uh sphere sort of thing so i don't know if, if have i engendered the podcast i need to uh maybe i need to change the the name or something else i digress uh if you guys want to find us there we also run a uh patron only slack patreon.com forward slash the brothers wish throw us a few bones traditionally we would give you access to the slack but I actually installed a matter matter most server i wanted to be matters most but it's not it's matter most um server which is kind of a basically a slick uh slack a slick slack knockoff that you host yourself so there is no like 10k message limit so we have everything in perpetuity so uh, occasionally guys will have to ask hey what was that thing from before because we hit the 10k limit yeah, that's not a problem anymore. So now you can just infinitely go back and search, which is great because there's a ton of information sharing we do on that thing. I mean, there's like, I think we have a close to 150 guys on there now. And it, I remember when we first started it, uh, somebody would ask a question. I would try and hurry up and answer it. And now it's impossible because somebody asks a question and five guys answer it before I ever see it and, and get there. So there's just such a wealth of knowledge and, uh, experience on there. People that have done a lot of things in a lot of places. I mean, there's a guy that, uh, before this did, uh, I think sprinkler system installs, right? So, uh, and then he became a whiz, right? So, uh, you know, I did wedding photography. Uh, there's people that have done, uh, what was it? I think art. There's a guy who was a skateboarder for a long time. Uh, just, you know, it's an interesting mix of folks. So jump in there and, uh, add something to the community. That's what I've been, you know what I've been, um, all these people have been getting isolated lately. And I, like I was saying the other day is that, um, uh, I've been a shut in for a really long time. And my sense of community is through that. Like I've built this group of people that I want around me and I surround myself with those folks and I've not been alone for a really long time. So, uh, if you guys are looking for something like that, you need something like that pop in. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe this is, uh, maybe this is the home you've been looking for. Like Justin has been for a long time. So thank you guys for listening. Justin, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. All right. And we'll talk to you guys later. Start searching, shooting up the web and neighborhoods, net surfing. We got horrible jokes. We're loud and annoying, but we're informative facts. We're not disappointing. Just give us a listen. Cause fun is the mission. I'm telling you, you don't know what you are missing. Ideas and some good comedy given. If you missed the show already, don't worry. You're forgiven.